Okay, this is up. Uh, here, let's zoom back. I don't know why I'm zoomed in. There we go. The TiVo Flash has been modded to complete linear rails and, and all axes. So if you remember right back in part one, I talked about adding these part bins that slide right into the extrusions. And yes, this whole video is going to be handheld, so it's going to be a bit shaky. You're going to have to bear with me on that. Then in part two, I added the linear rail for the Y carriage and talked about relocating the, the stepper. And now I've added the linear rail, as you can see, to the Z and to the X. There doesn't appear to be any slop in any of them. Basically, I thought I'd just give you a little heads up of how I went about doing it. And what I'm looking for here is an extruded piece of plastic. Here we go. This little piece of plastic was very important into this project because when you're going to add a rail to two sides, they've got to be exactly perpendicular with each other. If one's off or the other, your carriage is going to bind. So in order to know where to drill the holes for the screws that hold the rail in place, I made this little clip. And this clip would fit exactly into the extruded rail. This is before anything had been taken apart. And then I put a little box knife down in that groove and just slid this all the way down both sides and that gave me a scribed line telling me exactly where dead center was on uh, both the extrusions. So when I went to drill my holes they should be very uh, close to being in line. And when I went to drill holes for the carriages, for example those four there, those four there, in order to make sure those were exactly made I printed this template which gave me a place to do my center punching and then drilling and these little slots top and bottom I had transposed, see that little shiny mark? I transposed where center was top and bottom and then drew a line and I was able to line this up on the line that would tell me exactly where the two carriage points would go and that was uh, all very important not just from the standpoint of not wanting things to bind up from one side to the other but it was very important from the standpoint of if you can see up here, how perfectly lined up, here maybe I can rotate this, perfectly lined up the Z-Rod is, it's because when this all was going to go back on, that had to be exactly right still. If that wasn't right, then this rod would, as far as being in or out, that can be shimmed. But if it was left or right, it would be kind of screwed. So I had to make sure everything stayed centered like it was from the factory before. I printed out some... Uh, standoffs to or spacers whatever term you'd like to use to uh, get the right height and actually uh, had to do that about three times till I got it exactly right put that in with some slightly longer bolts and uh, that worked out okay here you can see the back of the, the hot end where the, the carriage is this piece of metal is the uh, part of the end stop sensor since that all kind of changed I had to relocate the end stop sensor originally would have been down here. It's now up on top so that this comes over and the piece of metal coasts over the top and that tells it when it's at, where it's at. The hot end uh, connecting to the, uh, to the belt used to connect to the bottom and in this particular layout it was going to make more sense to connect the belt to the top. So that meant, as you can see, when that carriage goes to the right, this belt goes to the left. So that meant I had to reverse the, the wires going to this stepper motor so that uh, everything would work correctly when it was put back together. Uh, what else? We've talked about just about everything. Um, I have noticed that when the cooling fans kick in, there's two of them, they will cool the, the hot end down for example if I'm up at 215 C for the first layer and if the cooling fans kick in that will knock it down to about 200 C and then of course it starts recovering but if at the time that it's trying to recover from that the bed is changing temperature which is normally what I do see is, being this is glass I would normally start with this bed at about 70 C for the first layer and 215 on the hot end, make sure everything's stuck good. Then after the first layer, I like to kick the bed back to about 60 C. This is an AC heat bed. It doesn't run off the power supply in the unit, in case you aren't aware. And then I also like to drop the temperature down to about 
210, 205, just depends on the PLA that I'm running at the time. And the problem with that is, is when the bed is being told to cool down, I guess it's in the firmware, I don't know, the machine will not adjust the temperature for the hot end until the bed has reached its new goal temperature. And this is a massive glass plate and aluminum bed. It takes a long time to drop 10C. In fact, it takes so long to drop 10C before the machine will start telling the hot end to adjust that the machine, because the hot end hasn't reached its new target temperature because it can't adjust to it because it's waiting for the bed to get done, it'll come up with a thermal uh, runaway error and shut down. So to get around it right now, I basically just leave the bed at its set temperature. Uh, leave the hot end set at about 205 rather than changing temperatures. And when these cooling fans kick in, I go into the on-screen menu and turn them down to about 75%. And then I'm okay. If I don't do that, though, it'll come up with a thermal runaway. So what I'd love to know, if any of you know the answer, if it's in the firmware, can I somebody show me how to change the firmware or somebody point me to an updated firmware because being that this is an AC heated bed it doesn't tax or draw upon the power supply that's in this printer it's separate it runs right off the the mains coming in there's no reason for this machine to be waiting for this bed to reach a temperature a target temperature change before it can make changes to the hot end they should both be able to happen simultaneously. So I'd love to have that happen simultaneously and of course eventually I'd also love to have someone uh, add a filament sensor. The mechanics of adding a sensor, no problem. The uh, sensor switches in, uh, in the flash are just a closure to ground and there, there are still inputs left on the control board so it'll be a, some sort of firmware change which again I would need someone to walk me through and I'm assuming that the flash has the bootloader already on board because it has a control in jack here so I'm assuming why would they bother putting that on if you weren't able to upgrade or change the firmware but anyway that's it for uh, the linear rails hopefully some of that might be applicable uh, for like an Ender 3 some of it may not, but I just thought I'd let you know how I did it and, and what it looks like and that it seems to work fine. Um, these were less expensive rails. I've never found, I know people say don't, don't buy cheap rails, but there's, I have never found a cheap rail. Uh, uh, these were 400 millimeter long and they were over 20 bucks a piece on sale and that was at the beginning of the year, so a long time ago now. Uh, so I'm assuming that these would be considered cheap rails, but at $20 for one rail, I don't consider that cheap. But low, low cost compared to others, yes, I, I would agree with you there. Anyway, I'd ordered five of these lower cost rails, and of the five, only one worked uh, as received. It was very smooth, very nice. And the others all had hitches on when you move them, you could feel it jerking and binding and just, just not smooth. In the end, I did two things. One, I did order new balls to put in the carriage to try reloading the carriage with new balls to see if that would fix it. But it, the new balls didn't really make any difference. What I found made the most difference was just to take the whole carriage apart, dump it into a little uh, container of alcohol, flush everything out, and the balls, the carriage, everything, then reassemble it and use some light machine oil on the on it while I was reassembling and then they seemed to work pretty good. Of the five that I ordered I got four of them to work which is all I needed to do this and one of the rails since there were five of them one of the rails it didn't matter what carriage you put on there they wouldn't work well on that carriage it bind up very badly so that tells me that I had one rail that isn't ground completely it isn't quite right so if you do end up having to order the lower cost rails, make sure you order an extra, at least, and be prepared to take the little carriages apart and clean them, clean them all out. I don't know if there's metal filings or dust or what it was that's, that's in there, but there's something in there that was keeping the balls from moving around smoothly. So clean all that out, put them back together, 
lube them up and they seem to be okay. I tried uh, lubing them with grease and that seemed to bind them up. I tried white lithium and I tried silicone. They didn't like either one of those. Um, again, what seemed to be working the best was like light machine oil, 3-in-1 oil, swing machine oil, just light gear oil seemed to give the best lube in this case. But um, no slop. Very impressed with all that. Um, we'll see how everything else goes. I'm going to add a silicone sock to the volcano hot end to see if that'll relieve the problem of the fans cooling the hot end down too much when they kick in. I'm going to play around with uh, stepper dampeners on the X and on the Y. See if we can cut back even more of the uh, stepper noise on those two. But uh, for now, that's it.